아, 안녕하십니까. 오늘 사회를 맡은 경제청 김성수 사무관입니다. 바쁘신 가운데도 이렇게 오늘 강연에 참석해 주신 여러분들께 감사의 말씀을 전합니다. 아, 먼저 어, 김진용 경제자유구역 청장님으로부터 환영사를 듣도록 하겠습니다. 네, 청장님 앞으로 자리해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. <웃음> 네, 여러분 반갑습니다. 경제자유구역청장 김진용입니다. 어, 오늘은 좀 특별한 어, 순서 그리고 특별한 기회를 마련했습니다. 어, 여러분 안내가 돼서 잘 아시다시피 로버트 해먼드 어, 선생님을 모시고 어, 우리가 어, 여러분이 잘 아시는 어, 맨하탄에 가면 이제 하이라인 있죠. 그래서 하이라인에 그 역사 그리고 그곳에 담겨져 있는 그 시민 운동가들의 어, 시민 또 활동가들의 어, 그런 어, 숨은 이야기 그리고 앞으로 우리 도시가 지금은 이제 경제 자유 구역을 중심으로 하는 어, 신 도시와 어, 이제 그 위에 그구 도심 지역이 있죠 이런 도시들을 어떻게 이해하고 어떻게 재개발을 해 나가야 되느냐. 라고 하는데 많은 암시를 줄 것으로 생각하는 그런 시간이 시간입니다. 그래서 우리가 어, 아트 센터에게 귀한 어, 세션을 가질 때만 이렇게 오픈을 하는데 오늘 이곳으로 어, 좀 어, 장소를 옮겨서 여러분들과 함께 어, 저 서로 이렇게 이야기를 나누는 그런 시간을 어, 마련했습니다. 사실 이제 많은 기획가들이 그리고 많은 이제 어 정부도 어 주도하는 사람들이 또 바뀌고 그러다 보면 일관된 정책으로 이어지기가 어려울 때가 있습니다. 그러면 이것을 보완하고 어떤 일관된 그리고 참신한 아이디어를 가져올 수 있는 소스가 어디겠는가 이런 것을 많이 어 생각하게 되는데 그것이 바로 하나의 저는 시빅스라고 생각을 합니다. 그래서 정권이 바뀌고 또 정책을 담당하는 사람들이 바뀐다고 하더라도 하나의 도시가 일관된 그런 노선을 갖고 쭉 발전해 나가려고 하면 은 시민사회에서 넓게 그리고 두툼하게 형성된 그런 어 어떤 어 생각들 이런 것들이 일관적으로 너무 좌우로 편차를 흐르지 않고 어 일관되게 어 도시의 한 방향을 설정해 나갈 수가 있더라고 어, 생각을 합니다. 그러가면서도 그러가면서도 참신한 아이디어들의 보고가 바로 시민 사회가 아닌가 생각합니다. 하이라인이라고 하는 것은 이제 어떤 하나의 기획가가 전부 다 설계를 하고 그것을 어, 추진을 해서 완성되었다라기보다는 이것을 어떻게 할 것인가, 어, 그 다음에 그 철로들이 다 녹슨 철로들을 어떻게 어, 만들 것인가, 가꿀 것인가, 철거하는 것이 옳은가, 그렇지 않은가. 어, 라고 하는 그런 논의의 과정에서 어, 이렇게 어, 아이디어들이 제공이 되고 또 그것이 어, 이제 공감대를 얻어가면서 또 그리고 그런 아이디어를 지지해주는 어떤 그 명사 유명한 사람들 그 다음에 또 시장 이런 분들이 있었기 때문에 가능했다라고 생각을 합니다. 오늘 자 로버트 해먼드 선생님을 모시고. 어, 그런 어, 이야기를 들어가면서 또 우리가 살고 있는 인천 우리가 살고 있는 도시가 어떤 식으로 바, 어, 이제 발전해 나가야 될까 이것을 어, 그럼 고민해 보는 그런 시간을 갖도록 하겠습니다 어, 여러분 어, 만나서 어, 반갑고 또 앞으로도 우리가 살고 있는 도시의 발전을 위해서 많은 관심과 아이디어를 주시기를 바라겠습니다 감사합니다 네, 총장님 어, 환영사 감사드립니다. 그 저희 로버트 하몬드 박사님이 저희가 참 모시기 힘든 분인데 오늘 이 강연회가 성사되기 위해서 굉장히 큰 역할을 해주신 분이 계십니다. 그 테르메 한국 대표이신 김인숙 회장님께서 그 지금 현재 로버트 하몬드가 미국 테르메 미국 
지사장으로 계시는 관계로 중간에서 이렇게 초청을 해주셔서 저희가 이런 좋은 강연을 하게 되겠습니다. 한번 박수 한번 쳐드려야 될것 같은데요. 예, 인사 한번 주시죠. 예. 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 그럼 그 강연에 앞서 오늘 강연하실 로버트 하몬드의 공식적인 프로필에 대해서 잠깐 소개 말씀드리겠습니다. 로버트 하몬드는 맨하탄에 버려진 고가 철도를 상징적인 도시공원으로 변모시킨 하일라인의 공동 창립자이며 이 프로젝트의 성공적인 수행을 20년간 리딩하시다가 최근에는 테르메 그룹 미국 대표로 근무 중에 있으십니다. 하이라인은 그의 리더십 아래 미국에서 가장 종, 사랑받는 공공중세 하나, 공공장소 중 하나로 성장했으며 혁신적인 디자인, 공공예술 프로그램 및 커뮤니티 프로그램으로 연간 800만 명의 방문객을 유치하고 있습니다. 이러한 업적을 인정받아 그는 로마 프라이즈, 빈센트 스컬리 프라이즈를 포함한 어, 세계적인 상을 24개 이상 수상하신 바 있습니다. 그럼 어, 어떠한 어, 이야기를 준비하셨을지 궁금한데요. 어, 로버트 하몬드를 저희 강단으로 초대하기로 하겠습니다. 네, 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. Well, thank you for uh, having me. It's an honor uh, to be here. Um, and it's really been exciting being able to see uh, around Incheon today. Um, I want to make a special thanks uh, to Mrs. Kim and Therma Group uh, Korea and for IFEZ for, for hosting me. Really appreciate that. So thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, the history of the High Line. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why I think it was successful and how I think that's applicable to cities all over the world. And then want to talk a little bit about Therma Group. Some of you probably don't know uh, what that is. Explain a little bit the connection between Highline and, and Therma. Let me turn this on. Yeah. So um, the Highline is an elevated uh, railroad that runs on the west side of Manhattan. It's about um, a mile and a half long. Um, and it was a freight train um, that used to run right in the middle of New York. And it was built to keep um, the trains off the street. You can actually see the trains running on the streets right there when it was first built. It was finished in 1934, um, and the last train rode in 1980. Um, and this is what it looked like when I first went up there. It was basically a mile and a half of wildflowers right in the middle of the city. Um, and it changed throughout the seasons. I loved it in, in, in winter. Um, and so I first heard about it. I read an article that it was going to be demolished um, in the New York Times. And I was 29 years old. And I thought someone would be working to preserve it and I could help out. Um, but no one was doing anything. And so I went to my first community meeting and sat next to this other guy. Um, and I didn't know him at the time. And in the meeting, no one cared about the High Line. And most people just wanted to tear it down. Uh, they asked me today. And it, was, it wasn't even called the High Line. It was called the West Side, Rail, West Side Elevated Rail Viaduct. So it didn't even have a very good name. Um, but at the end of the meeting, um, I went up to the guy sitting next to me and I said, why don't we do something together? Maybe we should try uh, to save it. And, but at the time, neither of us had any experience. I'm not an architect or a planner or hadn't been involved in politics. I was in, uh, worked on, in business uh, doing internet startups. And Joshua, the other co-founder, was a travel writer. So we had really no experience to get this um, done. Um, and we didn't have any money to build it, and we really didn't even have a plan. And in some ways, those were the keys to the success. No plan, no money, and no relevant experience. And I'll talk a little bit about why does, how does that make sense in, in, in doing this. But so what I knew is I was, uh, had been in business, and so I was thinking about it from marketing. That's why we changed the name from West Side Elevated Rail Viaduct to the High Line. And the first thing I did was get a logo. 
um, you know, where you can see the train, the, the train tracks in the logo. Um, but at the time, it was very unpopular. This was our mayor, Mayor Giuliani, um, was the mayor of New York. He wanted to tear it down. He actually signed a demolition order three days before he left office. Um, and then the, our next mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, in the middle, um, we really partnered with him. This was a really a public-private partnership. We were and always were a private nonprofit. We weren't part of the city, but we partnered with the city. Um, that's Hillary Clinton, who was our senator at the time, and these are some other elected officials. I don't know if it's true in Korea, but you see how all the elected officials, they don't look at each other. They stand very close, but they look in different directions. Um, but so I, I just think it's important because Bloomberg really took a risk on this. At the time, now the High Line is very successful, but at the time, no one thought it was, would, would, would happen. And so we really had a mayor that was really to take a, a, a risk. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the details on how we saved it, but it's really about, people say, oh, this is a park project. It's not really a park project, it's a real estate project. And that's how we looked, had to go about saving it. We had to rezone the entire neighborhood. And basically, from a manufacturing to residential. And we had to transfer development rights that are normally on the High Line to buildings next to it. That's what enabled it to make economic sense. This is what the neighborhood looked like uh, when we started. Uh, and this is what we projected would happen when we built it. It became actually much more successful than this. But um, even in, in 2000, so we started it in 1999, um, but even in 2003 when we had the support of the mayor, we still didn't have any money. We were still fighting um, developers that wanted to tear it down. So we did an ideas competition. And we said, let's hear from people all over the world what they think we should do with it. And the ideas didn't have to be realistic. This was my favorite, which is a mile-long lap pool. Um, we had three, uh, 680 entries from around the world. This was from Russia, more, you know, more of an artistic. This is another favorite. This was a, a roller coaster that would go through the city. This was talking about the programming. Because just as important as the design is what happens in and around it. This was building a prison and a pool. Um, this is playing off of high and high line, I think. Um, and again, the smile long roller coaster. And then we had the exhibition in Grand Central, which is our main railroad station. Because we wanted, even though this was in one neighborhood, we wanted to say this, this project was about the whole city. And this was about building awareness and building basically a brand. The way that I approached it is the same way as you would, you know, if you're introducing a new product. You come out with the brand and before you sell the product, you introduce the product. And that's what all of this was about. We also, the advantage of not being an architect. If I was an architect, I would have my vision. I would know what I wanted to do with it. Because we weren't architects, we wanted other people to help us figure out what it was going to be. So this was a postcard we sent out to people. We had dozens of community input sessions to hear from people what they wanted to see on the High Line. So to create support for the project. And then we did an ideas competition. I mean, a design competition to find a designer. And we had four finalists. Zaha Hadid, who I know has built here uh, in, in Korea. Interestingly, when I asked her, why are there no plants? I mean, trees, that was actually AstroTurk, fake grass. I said, why, are there, why do you not have any trees? And she said, well, trees are just things people put when they don't know what to do with the space. So I thought maybe she wouldn't be the right choice. Uh, Michael Van Valkenburg, who's a landscape architect. Uh, Stephen Hall, uh, another architect, really thought about building on top of it. So you have this space, it was very much, OK, so let's use this as a space for architecture. But the, the winning design was a team. It was uh, led by a landscape architect. I think that's very important. Um, the lead was a landscape, not an architect, uh, with Dillers Cofidio and Rinfro and Pete Uldoff, who is a planting designer. And this was their concept, very simple. No architecture on top. Um, 
And it was basically a planking system that could be used in different ways. And people think about the, the, the design for the High Line is really complicated, but it's actually very simple. And it was an expensive project to build because we had to remediate it, it had lead paint. But the design was actually not that expensive. First, we had to clear the concrete that was there, and put in the new drainage. And then, now, these planks are like a kit of parts. They're almost like little Legos. Very easy to build. They're basically just like concrete parking curbs. Very inexpensive. And then you place them in pieces. This is where they were, you could see we put the rails back and you put them in piece by piece and then you put the planting in around it. And it, the idea was that it blurs the line between the hard and the soft. It's man-made in nature sort of coming together. And that's what it looked like the day that we opened. Um, and then the planting is very important. Um, and it was done by a, a Dutch horticulturist named Piet Uldoff. And the idea was is that flowers and different plants would come up throughout the year. There's no um, annuals, it's all perennial. So we don't plant something, take it out and put it back. Um, it's also, we picked planting for what it looks like after it's dead, <laughs> which is something very different. Most people think, oh, you know, the most important thing is the, is the color of the flowers. Pete Uldoff had a quote that says, brown is a color too, and that, that Part of it is like sort of the architecture of the, of the plants. And again, it's just all different seasons. It's completely changing. And then the lighting. Something most people don't think a lot about is the lighting. And we used a lighting designer named Hervé Descot. And his idea, normally when you go into a park, you have lighting above you, like this light. It's very you know, bright in your face. It's not very flattering. Um, and then you can't see, like right now I can't see you because this light is so strong, it's harder for me to see you. And so if you're in a park and you have overhead light, you can see your pathway, but you can't see the plants that aren't lit. So his idea was to have the lighting be low to light your plants, but it's not in your eyes. So we attach the lighting to the railing. And then it gives this very, and it's very flattering for people, and it lights all the plants at night. So actually, my favorite time on the High Line is at night. There you can see it lit up with New York. Uh, this is one of my favorite features. So this is also where, so how do you take something that's sort of ugly, it's, it's a big structure on top of the street. Most, this is why people wanted to tear it down. It was dark underneath. You know, it just looked like an abandoned piece of steel. And so how do you change people's perception of that? And so the idea was to cut and make a little theater inside it that you could see. And then there's, there's a ramp that goes all the way to the bottom, um, but it also creates steps so you can do performances. And this is what it looks like now with that glass cut out. Um, there you can see it. And what people do, the other thing is, most, most parks are meant to be an escape from the city. Like Central Park in New York, and you have your own Central Park. You know, you're living in the city, you want to go and you want to be nature, pretend you're not in a city. That's not what the High Line is. The High Line is part of the city. And, and actually, what are people doing here? They're actually watching the traffic. They're sitting over the street watching the traffic. Normally something you think is really ugly. And people just sit there for hours watching the traffic. And so it's how do you make, sort of change people's perception of something they might not think is beautiful or interesting. Um, so this is what, and, and I think the other thing that was important is how do you make, often you can make the pictures before it's built look really good. How do you make the final product as beautiful? So this is what it looked like uh, when it was just finished. And I, I want to show this, that's a hotel called the Standard Hotel. And I I'm going to show you a picture of someone in one of those rooms in just a minute. Um, this is what it looks like now. So the Whitney Museum, one of the New York's best contemporary museums, moved into that site right next to the High Line. They were on the Upper East Side. They moved downtown to be near the High Line. 
And it's really a spine. The, thing, the High Lane is very narrow. It's not very much space. It's like a seven acres. Um, but why it has sort of an outside view is because it runs through. It runs through four different neighborhoods, connecting them together. And it, 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 the success uh, surprised all of us. You know, they made a perfume out of it. I, I would have never imagined that they would make a perfume. And sadly, I didn't trademark fragrances. So someone else gets all the money for the, for the perfume. You know, it became in a, in a Spider-Man comic books. There's that space that goes over the city. And this is what people started doing in the hotel rooms. This became a problem, is people would undress in the hotel rooms for the people on the High Line. So one of the unexpected consequences of the High Line. And then this is, um, this is a postcard of New York that I found on the street. And what was interesting, with just in a few years, the High Line became like a landmark, like Central Park, or the Empire State Building, or the Statue of Liberty. And so it, it, it had, um, before the pandemic, we had about 8 million visitors. Uh, this year, we'll probably have 7. Next year, I think it'll be uh, past 8 million. And putting that perspective, the Metropolitan Museum has about 7 million visitors. But the Metropolitan Museum is 40 times our size. Um, the only, uh, and, and the Louvre in, in Paris, which is the most visited museum, has 9 million visitors. Um, and, it, and it created a boom in development. Remember I said it's not really a park or just an architecture project? It was a real estate project. And these are all of the developments, over 100 different developments that happened after we opened. The biggest development is called Hudson Yards. Um, a really interesting, one of the things I'm very envious, I feel like um, Korea has so much to teach America about how to get projects done. Y'all are thinking, I'm just so impressed how this entire city has been built so quickly. Y'all, and y'all are thinking of the future. How are you going to keep building? This is one of the few areas in Manhattan where we could expand. So this was a railroad track under here. And they built a platform and basically built a new city on top of it. And the High Line runs around it. Um, this is, Zaha Hadid didn't build the High Line, but she built a building next to the High Line. And these are these new sort of skyscrapers. There's a mall. There's something called The Vessel by Thomas Heatherwick. And there's something called The Shed, which is a, a, a cultural facility actually built by our architects, Stiller Scafidio and Renfro. So yeah, that's what it, the design looks like, and that's what it looks like now. So it's coming, the High Line goes all around that. And it's become a real uh, place. Uh, there was almost no new architecture, and all these different architects have built things along the High Line. Um, I said Zaha Hadid, Jean Nouvel, Frank Gehry, um, Cesar Pelli, I am Pei, have all built things you know, near the High Line. Um, and so, um, we, this, the winner, one of the ways we convinced um, Mayor Bloomberg to, to, to do this project is that we said it would create value for the city in new tax revenues. Because if you increase the value, if more people build, the city gets more tax revenues. And so we said over, we thought over a, a, 20, mil, a, a 20 year period, it would create about $150 million in new tax revenues. It turns out it's going to create um, uh, $1.5 billion. So that's what the city put in. It's about 1,000 return on investment. I mentioned programs because it's not enough just to, to build a space. Let me just get a little drink. You have to program it. Because how do you keep people coming back? And this is what a lot of projects sometimes don't think about. So we do over 450 free programs throughout the year. Um, we do programs for kids. We do programs at night for, for adults. Um, this is something called the Mile Long Opera. Normally, an opera is like on a stage, and you sit down, and the performers are up here, and they move back and forth, and you just sit there. In this opera, there was a thousand singers lining the High Line, 
And the way you experienced it was you walked for the whole mile. And you would hear the different songs as you walk by. And it was, um, and we used over 20 different languages. I know we had, we had different um, choirs. I know we had a Korean, we had a Chinese. Um, that, so you would hear all, sort of like the city, you would hear these different stories in different languages as you walked by. We also, there's a lot of um, public housing next to the High Line. There are a lot of people um, that do not have very much income. And we wanted to do things that help them. So we started hiring teens. And these, these young people create their own programs for the High Line. This is something called Teen Night that we do uh, twice a year. Um, also, art has been incredibly important to the High Line. So the High Line runs through this neighborhood called Chelsea, one of the neighborhoods it runs through. And there's more galleries in Chelsea than anywhere in the world. But the problem with galleries is sometimes people don't feel comfortable going in an art gallery. You know, if you're not wealthy, you might not feel comfortable. You don't know where they are. Um, you, you don't maybe understand the art. And so we wanted to bring the best contemporary art to the park for free. And, and a lot of people said, oh, people, the public won't understand contemporary art or they won't like it. And we thought they actually would like it. And so we did art not just on the High Line. This is John Baldessari, a $100,000 bill. We, we put art on billboards next to the High Line. We put art on the High Line. We put art on the side. This is El Natsui, an African artist, on the side of buildings. And we've done um, over 350 different art projects, over half of them women. Um, from uh, 72 countries, I think we've, had, we've done three Korean um, artists. And this is my favorite in the middle. We did right over the street, so you drive under it. And people love the art. It's one of the reasons people keep coming back. It's also not um, permanent. It's always changing. So we never keep anything up for more than a year. And so it also en en enables you to take risks. Because if people don't like it, you just say, OK, don't worry. It's going to be gone in a year. And then the High Line has become much more successful than we thought, and it has spawned other projects all over um, North America. So we started something called the High Line Network. And it's a network of other projects, not just on top of railroads, but on top of infrastructure, leftover pieces of the city. And this park is in Dallas, and it was built over a freeway. The freeway used to run through the middle of the city, and it cut these two neighborhoods off. You couldn't really cross. So it built this park, and it connected these two um, neighborhoods. Um, this was an all, uh, in, in, a, in an old uh, sewage area of a city. This is in Austin. This just opened. This is a park underneath a people mover in Miami. Um, Miami, no one walks. Everyone drives. And so they built, it's eventually going to be 13 miles connecting and one of the things that it's trying to do is to get people to walk to get people out there and exercising and connecting different neighborhoods this is an old belt line this goes all the way around atlanta this would when it happens would be the biggest project this is the los angeles river if you watch movies in, in that take place in la this is where the car races always are <laughs> or if you've seen greece that's the final scene is there um, and they want to build it into a park this is one of my favorite projects in Washington, D.C. Um, by Rim Coolhouse. So wh why are all these um, projects, wh why has this been successful? Um, and I think it's the way people use public space. And, and it's even the way people use their free time. How do they experience culture? The old way people experience culture was you sort of went to a box. So if I wanted nature, I would go to the botanical garden, which is sort of a box of nature. If I wanted to art, I would go to a museum, an art box. If I wanted uh, to see you know, entertainment, I would go to the theater box. If I wanted to play, I'd go to the playground. If I wanted exercise, I'd go to the gym. If I wanted community or spirituality, I would go to church. 
Now, people want to experience it very differently. They want multiple things at the same time. Also, in the old days, the way people experienced this, if they went, they went by themselves or maybe with the family. Now, people want to go in a group. You know, all the friends want to go and they want to capture it on Instagram. So it doesn't, it's not real unless you can capture it. And so that, this is what the Highline did. And I wish I could say I was smart enough to have thought all this out. I think in some ways we just got lucky. And we opened it at a, at a time where, you know, the Highline is part botanical garden. So you get that if you want plants. You get art, like a museum. You get entertainment with the programming. You get places for kids to play. You have wellness. And very importantly, you know, right now, I think one of the biggest problems that we're having in the US, and I think it's worldwide, is, is there's no places for community together. There's no places for us to connect with each other. And I think that's one of the really important parts about the Highline. And you can do all that together, and you can capture it, you know, uh, on your phone. And now I want to talk a little bit about Therma, but, and the connection I'll make at the end is a little bit, you know, the, I, I, I got an American Academy in Rome prize, and so I got to go live in, in Rome for a year. And one of the things I never understood is how, th this is one of the Roman baths, um, and why haven't we built one of these since then? <laughs> you know, in 2,000 years, We've made all these advances, but we couldn't combine, you know, and in these Roman baths, they had libraries, they had food, they had exercise, they had swimming. I asked um, a, a, a historian who specializes in, in, in Roman uh, baths, I said, why did people go to the baths? He said, two things, gossip and politics. <laughs> he said, this is where the politics of the city happened. This is where, th this was the heart of the city. Um, and instead, all we have now is Disneyland. <laughs> you know, that's what we got after 2,000 years, which I, Disneyland is very fun, but um, it really manipulates your chemistry. I don't know if, you know, kids want to go, but it manipulates your chemistry through caffeine, through adrenaline, <laughs> through sugar. And at the end of the day, after you leave Disneyland, you know, you're exhausted, you feel ill, your wallet is empty, <laughs> and, but your kids want to come back. Um, and that's why I think Therma is something different. See, to me, Therma has the opportunity to be like that Roman bath. And instead of manipulating your chemistry, it balances your chemistry. So to me, the way I think of a Therma, it's like a wellness Disneyland in some ways. Um, the other thing that, um, and so my father always asks me, why did you, he's so, when I started the Highline, he said, why are you doing this? I don't understand. Why don't you have a normal job? You know, what, <laughs> why can't, what is gonna happen? And, and then when, when the Highline opened and his friends came, then he liked the Highline. And so then when I left, he said, why would you leave the Highline? Why would you leave the Highline? And, and what is this Therma thing? Because he just couldn't understand it because it's a little bit confusing because it's a whole bunch of different things. But one thing is very important. The Thermas are, are huge. The, the smallest one is about 28,000 um, uh, the uh, square meters, the largest is 70,000 square meters. So they're huge. It's like almost like an airport. It, it, it would be the size of, for us, Yankee Stadium. Um, and the other thing that attracted me is that it is not a luxury product. It's not something just for the very wealthy. Most wellness um, activities, massage, you know, nutrition is really, at least in the U.S., for the very wealthy. This is, is much more accessible. We, um, each facility can have almost a million and a half visitors a year. It's also um, across different groups. In the morning, you see a lot of older people, afternoon families, and at night, single, uh, you know, dating groups. And people don't come along. The, the other thing that's different, you know, a, traditionally a spa is underground. It's in the basement. It's dark. You come alone. You don't really want to see anybody else. Therma, very few people come alone. They come in groups. 
They come to meet other people. It's natural light. It's plants. It's not expensive. People come all through the year. They come in the winter to go inside and sit under a palm tree. And they come in the summer because it's really hot outside and it's just perfect in, in Therma. And so Therma, going back to the boxes like the High Line, this is why it reminded me of the High Line. And this is what I think you're going to see more and more. And Therma is just one example. I think you're going to have more and more cities build what I think of it is like wellness infrastructure. You know, right now we think of infrastructure that all cities need. Cities need roads. They need subways. They need, um, you know, government buildings. But they also are going to need places to keep people well. And again, people want to do multiple things at one time. And that's why I think, and again, it doesn't just have to be Therma. I, I sort of, to me, Therma is one example of this. But Therma is like a botanical garden. It's like we have art, like a museum, entertainment, play, wellness, community. Um, in most cities that we're in, we're sometimes the largest botanical gardens. There are over 7,000 plants uh, in, in one Therma. Um, we uh, invest a lot in art. We have a whole group called Therma Art that comes up with different experiential art to do inside the Therma. Um, entertainment, you know, at night, it's like a club at night. I mean, I would be asleep when this is happening, but for, for, for younger people, they love it. Um, and then play. Um, but it's not most, sometimes people think, oh, is Therma a water park? It is not a water park. What are the two things that you happen when you go in a water park? You smell the chlorine or mold, either one of those. And Therma uses a special technique that there is no chlorine and it smells fresh. The water is clean through osmosis. Um, it's also not loud. And the advantage is kids cannot go in this part. Kids are only allowed in here. And so adults are only allowed in here. So you can also escape your children or other people's children. Um, and, and wellness, food, and then this kind of community. Again, to me, this is, this is the most important part of wellness. I mean, we need to eat right, we need to exercise, but they say the number one indicator of living longer is personal relationships. So it's not the food that you're just, you need to eat well and you need to exercise, you need to do all those things. But more importantly is having those human interactions. And now with more and more of us just living, you know, on our phone, we need places to be with each other. Um, there's also, you know, some people say, oh, well, that's a lot of wasted, you know, water. Actually, um, the thermo was lead platinum. All of the water is geothermal water and we recycle 90% of the water. Um, and the heating is done through geothermal. Right now, there are six um, thermas uh, in Europe. Um, two of them are the largest, or, or one and four of the largest uh, water attractions in Europe. Um, that's not, sorry. It, and it's continued to grow uh, since COVID. We're up 20% from um, 2019. And we have a few, we have one under construction in Manchester. We have um, uh, four in pre-development and, and, and one of the places that we most wanna be is in here in Korea. And then one of the things I'm working on is bringing it to the US. We wanna be in 10 US cities in 10 years is our goal. Um, the other thing, I won't go into this, but what, when I go to Therma, my favorite thing is to go into the basement to see the technology of how it works. Because that's what's so different. How do you keep the air fresh? How do you keep the water from not smelling? How do you do it in an inexpensive way? So I just want to go back um, to the High Line. And that's what I think it's been so interesting being toured around Incheon is in the US, most of urban planning is only done by the developers. <laughs> and developers don't really care about the wellness of, their, of, of the citizens of the city, nor should they. They want to make money for their uh, shareholders. And what's interesting here, you all have a really interesting model of the public and private working together 
to think about how you want to build your cities for the future. And to me, one of the hallmarks of successful cities are how much of this wellness infrastructure. People, because now cities are competing global. You know, I know that's, Incheon is, you know, is going to be an international city. And that's what's going to be important. So I always tell New Yorkers, New York, people might love New York now. If we don't keep changing, if we don't develop it, if we don't make it a city that's more healthy, people aren't going to stay there anymore. And so that's why I think it's really important to think about how do we build, and again, not just this, but how do we build parks? How do we build libraries? To me, all of that is that wellness infrastructure. Um, and feel free to get in touch with me. My email is up there. I'm on Instagram at the Highline Guy. Um, and that's it. And now I wanted to leave some time for questions. And I'm going to put on my headset. Thank you, Robbie. 박수 한번 주시죠. Q&A 세션을 할 건데요. 그 라비한테 동시 통역으로 어, 번역돼서 전달이 될 거니까 질문을 좀 간단하고 명료하게 해주시면 감사하겠습니다. 네, 질문 한번 받아보겠습니다. 아, 네, 여기 마이크. 아, 오늘 강연 잘 들었습니다. 저는 어, 아이셀지의 네, 강연 잘 들었습니다. 저는 아이페즈의 기획팀장 전지숙입니다. No. <웃음> Thank you for your lecture. It's very helpful. It's very helpful. Uh, 그리고 uh, 통역, <웃음> please. 네, 네. 저는 어, 그 테르메가 굉장히 한국 사람, 한국 사람들의 정, 음, 그 캐릭터에 굉장히 잘 어울리는 컨셉이라고 생각을 합니다. She think that Terme is very well match with the Korean tradition. 그리고 한국 사람들은 굉장히 그 목욕을 좋아합니다. Korean people love to bath. <웃음> For sure. 아, 그래서 만약에 어, 테르메가 인천에 오게 된다면 전그 대한민국의 국민들의 어, 열광을 얻을 거라고 믿고 있습니다. She's for sure if Terme comes to Incheon, it will very welcome and people will crazy, very excited about it. 그런데 테르메가 굉장히 넓다고 말씀하셨거든요. 그런데 어뭐 여섯 가지 박스를 예를 드셨어요. 근데 그 테르메 빠진 게한 가지가 있다면 숙박인데요. 숙박. 아. 그 so. 넓은 곳을. 아, 하루 만에 다 즐기기에는 너무나 넓기 때문에 숙박 부분은 어떻게 해결을 하실 수 있을 건지 네, 그것이 궁금합니다. So you said that the Terme has a very vast uh, volume of the space mm -hmm. and it has six category of the uh, like basic concepts of boxes. Mm -hmm. But she think that the one of the missing is that the uh, um, the lodging option. Yeah. Maybe it is big enough, uh, yeah. not enough time for the one day. So she is questioning that if, if you have any plan or idea about uh, resolving those issues. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I should have said, I think one of the reasons um, Korean culture is so much more sophisticated than ours in America is you've always had this culture of bathing. One of my favorite places in New York is called Sojo. It's a Korean spa. Um, it's actually in New Jersey because it has a view of, of, of New York. Um, so why don't we have lodging? Well, there's one in Germany that has lodging. Generally, we have other people. We're an expert on bathing. Or the, and really, we have the technology of how you build the therma. And so we let other people uh, right now build the hotels. I think that might be something we will do in the future. Um, so it's a good, it's a good question. Let's <laughs> 네, 안녕하세요. 강연 잘 들었습니다. 저는 조경을 설계하고 있는 사람입니다. Uh, his landscape architecture. Oh. <웃음> 그 하이라인 프로젝트를 하면서 지금 강연자 분하고 실제 조경 설계 가하고 이 역할 분담이 어떻게 됐을지 궁금합니다. 
um, while you um, doing the Highline project, what is the role um, role development, uh, role and responsibility divided by with uh, you between you and uh, landscape architecture? Yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to reiterate: um, I, landscape architects don't get enough credit, um, and often. Um, what projects do is they, hi even if they're building a park, they hire an architect to be the lead and then the architect hires a landscape architect. We did it the opposite. The landscape architect worked with the architect. Um, we worked very closely with them. Uh, you know, but again, I'm not a, a designer, but I had a vision for what I wanted. So we would meet sometimes twice a week and we've continued to work with the same firm. We're, uh, right before I left the Highline, we designed a new piece that's going to open uh, later this year. So we're still working um, with the same, uh, you know, designers for now it's been um, 20, 20 years. Um, so it really was a partnership and with the city because the city actually owned the project. This is something also that's a little harder for people to understand um, outside, May, and it's mainly in New York. In New York, Central Park is also privately maintained by a nonprofit that raises its own money, but it's owned by the city. So we have to work with the city and us and then the design team. And then within the design team, we have the landscape architects, the architects, and the planting designer. And so often, all five of us did not agree. <laughs> And so that was really one of the more interesting parts of the project is how do you get people to come together and how do you preserve, to me, that, because I don't have any uh, specific uh, skill, um, you know, I, I can't draw you a, a plan, but what I felt like I was good at is, is, is keeping that vision from getting a, chopped down because of costs or because of regu regulations. And all great buildings, you know, that's what you have to do is to preserve that vi vision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 어, 인천연구원의 권전으로 갑니다. 어, 우리나라에서는 청계천 고가도로를 이제 없앤 이후에 고가도로는 가급적이면 철거하자는 게 전반적인 어떤 사회 분위기 같습니다. 그 하이라인을 건설할 때 아마도 이제 그 주변에 1층에 근무하, 거주하시는 분 같은 경우 특히 그럴 것 같은데요. 그 하이라인 아래쪽이 상당히 시각적으로 차단이 많이 되고 어두울 것 같아요. 그래서 그 주역 주변 주변에 있는 주민들이 상당히 많이 반대를 했을 것 같은데 진행하는 과정에서 어땠는지 좀 알고 싶습니다. Um, in Korea there is a, in Seoul there is a similar old structure called the Cheonggyecheon. Uh, we we took that out and we recovered the an original the uh, the streaming. Um, when he see the uh, Highline project especially the somebody who lives in first floor uh, nearby will uh, the highline structure itself will block more uh, light uh, and some the older people here who live there might not like uh, the idea of it so his question was how you do resolve those opposite opinions and ideas well first of all uh I want to say that the canal was actually one of my inspirations for the High Line because Korea did that. When did that open? Do you know? The canal? 청계천이 언제 복개됐어? 다시 오픈됐었죠? 이명박 대통령 때니까. But before the High Line. 이명박 시장 때된 건데. So it was before the High Line. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the things why it was inspiring to me is normally people would see that as something ugly. <laughs> and something that you, you know, you don't like, that's why they covered it up in the first place. Um, and so it was sort of appreciating this kind of city infrastructure and bringing it to the public and sort of letting nature 
into it as well. So I think it was one of, to me, an inspiration for the High Line. Um, the advantage of the High Line is not very many people live next to it when we built it. So this was a train running down a neighborhood. It was loud. It was, you know, to me it would be romantic. Oh, you have a train. It was not romantic. No one lived near it because it was loud. It was dirty. And so that was one of the advantages um, is that there weren't people living. Now the people that live next to it know that it's there. And so when you're buying an apartment, you pay more if you're three, two stories above the High Line. You pay less if you're at the High Line level. And people, you can see in people's bathroom, their living room, their bedroom. And so, you know, it takes the, they know what they're getting when they move into those um, spaces. But it's very interesting. There's a project in Chicago called the 606 that um, is, is still having a lot of problems getting it built because people next to it don't want public next to their, uh, you know, homes. 조금만 더 토론을 하면은 그 2층에 사시는 분은 프리미엄을 갖고 있을 것 같은데 저 그림에 있으면 저불 켜져 있는 집 있지 않습니까? 저 집에 계신 분은 불편하실 것 같다는 생각이 좀 듭니다. 한 가지만 더 여쭤보도록 하겠습니다. 저기 그 하이라인 다 이제 완성된 다음에 다양한 어떤 예술 프로그램하고 뭐 이, 미술 작품도 계속 이제 바꿔가면서 이제 설치하는 것 같은데 이 유지 관리는 누구와 하며 비용은 어떻게 조달하는지 알고 싶습니다. 어, 일단 그 1층에 계신 분들에 대해서는 아까 통역이 다 됐는지 모르겠는데 하이라인이 원래 기차길이었기 때문에 사시는 분이 없었고 하이라인이 된 다음에 이사 오시는 분들은 자기가 어떤 상황으로 이사 오는지를 아셨 새로 이사 온 분들이기 때문에 어, 1층에 있는 것이 가격은 싼데 그리고 저렇게 안 좋은 점들이 있지만 그 이후에 이사 오신 거기 때문에 이제 큰 불만이 없었다 이렇게 답변하셨고요. The his second question was seems like you have many the art and cultural programs you running mm -hmm. on the high high yes. line. It, it it that will be um, you know cost involving. So yep. who who pays and how you manage? all those costs. Yeah. I, I mean, the reason, one of the reasons we do it is we depend on donations to run. And so the people, tourists come once and they leave. They don't give us any money. And unfortunately, we don't charge them any money. If we just charged a few dollars, we would have, you know, an eight million visitors, we'd be done. Um, and so we need New Yorkers to help give money. And New Yorkers, that's what locals want, is programming. You know, if you just have a nice park, they walk on it every once in a while. But the reason they come back, the reason they feel connected to you is the programming. And, and people don't want to give money to clean the bathroom. They don't want to give money to the gardeners. They don't want to give money to empty the trash. They want to give money to the art program. They want to give money to the kids program. They want to give money to hire teens. They want to give money for the mile long opera. So we actually make money. We raise more money for the programs than it costs to put them on. And we move that money over to take out the trash. Because whenever anybody is doing these projects, the number one thing I tell them to worry about is in some ways it's easier to give money to, to build something because you know politicians like to go to a ribbon cutting, people like to open things, we can put your name, you know, if you give enough money you can put your name here. But people do not like to give money to keep things clean, to maintain it, to repaint it, to you know, replant the plants. And so that's what the programming in some ways is is a, it helps us raise money, even though it costs us to do it. And it makes it, that's why New Yorkers feel connected to it. Because ultimately, if it's just for tourists, it actually doesn't work. No one wants to go to Times Square. No one, I've never even been to the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> um, partly because it's all tourists and it's crowded. And so one of the biggest problems we've had, it's an odd problem, is too many people. Eight million people we can have 20,000 people you know, in one day, and it is crowded. And the New Yorkers, you know, if they think it's too crowded, then they don't want to come. And again, that's why we do programming at times when it's not crowded. We don't do any program on a Saturday at 2 o'clock 
it's plenty, plenty of people are coming. We do programs in the morning. We do programs at night. We do programs in the winter, um, you know, at times to try to flatten out the curve. Um, so we get, and it's sort of the interesting thing now being at Therma, that's also what you want to do. You don't, you know, everybody wants to come on the, the uh, on holidays. How do you get people to come? And so you have more of a constant visitorship. That's the other thing programming does. Is it okay if I speak in English? Yes. Well. <laughs> so I'm also a landscape architect oh. trained in the United States. Actually, James Corner was my dean when I oh. studied there. At Penn? So, yeah. Oh. So I heard so much about the project. It's a legendary, it's very innovative project, for especially for landscape architects. Um, but... It was so it was so interesting to hear your side of story, your point of view. And it was interesting how you said it was real estate project, mm -hmm. not a park project. Yeah. And I was wondering, you know, Urban Design 101, like put real estate on the street and people walk around and then that activates the neighborhood. Yeah. But this is actually elevated, so it successfully separated pedestrians from vehicles, but that's it. So I just was wondering why you think it was, it br brought in so many re successful real estate around the park, and if you've seen the same situation to Underline, Beltline, or LA River Project, some yep. other Friends of Highline Project, yep. and in the end, maybe the project that you're doing at Therma Group, what would, be successful as a real estate aspect of the project in yeah. the city. Yeah, well, let's get a picture. We can get, come get a picture and we can send it to Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and sure. my the other co-founder went to Penn. Oh, Joshua David went to nice. Penn. Um, but not a landscape architect. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I think this is a, the, it's an interesting question. A lot of people thought the High Line was a bad idea when we started for two reasons. One, America has a lot of elevated walkways in certain cities, like Minneapolis, it's very cold. So they built all these walkways to connect the buildings. And then no one walked on the street and everything, the street became unsafe. All the stores closed because there was no traffic. And they, 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 you know, if you, in urban planning, most people say elevated walkways, you know, don't, don't do. Um, the other thing they were worried is this neighborhood didn't have enough people on the street anyway. And so they were like, why are you taking people off? And so one, the reason the High Line is different is the High Line is mainly not about people going from A to B. Yes, it's not about pedestrian safety. Yes, it's safer, you know, if you walk up there. But it's really, it's the planting and the historic structure that makes it different from other elevated railroads. The other thing is the scale. So normally when you go up in a building, you get like uh, this view and people look like ants. The High Line, one of the things, it's only two and a half stories up. So you can still make eye contact with people on the street. It still keeps the street safe because there's more people watching the street. And we have exits every few blocks. So people are constantly coming off. And so it's been successful for the stores around it. Um, and, you know, I, I almost think that, uh, I mean, landscape architects should take classes in real estate. But really, real estate developers should take classes in landscape. Because it's where they, landscape is the cheapest part of all projects. Plants cost zero. They are rounding errors in, you know, a multi-million dollar or half a billion dollar project. It's nothing. And it's where they spend the least, the least amount of tension, and where I think it creates a lot, a lot of value. And that's one of the things I want to do with Therma. Right now, Thermas are mostly located outside the cities. They're near airports. They have, you know, 100 acres that, you know, because the land was cheap. Now, um, we want to build all the, and one of the reasons I came is they want to build all the thermos in the city, make them urban. The other thing right now, Therma is a Therma surrounded by a parking lot. There's no public open space except the parking lot. Um, and what we want to do is put Thermas in cities and surround it with public free open space. 
Um, and so to me, that's really the important piece. That, that's really why I came to work here. Not just what's inside Therma, but what's outside um, Therma. Thank you. Oh, thank you for your lecture. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you a, a question in English. So I'm not sure you have enough time uh, to look around Songdo. So in also Seoul, I'm not sure um, how many times you visit in Korea. So anyway, welcome to Songdo. Thank you. And um, I work in Songdo, and sometimes I feel like Songdo is a kind of empty city because it's hard to uh, see people in the street and maybe the shopping mall. There are many people there, but in the street, like the especially weekdays, uh, it's hard to see people here. Um, so um, um, I like to hear about your um, like point of view about Songdo. Like there are some critics about Songdo and also some positive things and negative things. And you know maybe Songdo is uh, known as a um, like smart city yeah. and also um, global and international city. Uh, so in that wise, um, what do you think about Songdo? I like to hear about your critics, bad yeah. things and good things about Songdo. Yeah. Well, first of all, this is my first, this is, I've only been in Korea for less than 24 hours. <laughs> but I have spent all today here, and so I, I can't say I under, know it at all. But I think one of the really hard things and the, really, the challenges, and in some ways, you're living in an experiment, an experiment, ex, an experiment because you're building a city from scratch which is very hard to do you know um, how old is Seoul thousands of, I mean <laughs> how long has Seoul been there you know it's built up and that's what makes city fabric is the old and the new and so I think what's interesting is how do you create some of that feeling of a traditional city when you're building it in 20 years and I think it doesn't happen overnight and I think the other thing is What's interesting about seeing this is it is a city being built for the future. So in some ways it's being built. This public spaces, the streets, the cultural facilities are being built for the people that are coming that aren't just here because you're growing the city so fast. So, I, you know, I think that's sort of the, the, the challenge and sort of the interesting part. Um, but to me that's where, again, where it goes back to programming how do you program public spaces that people want to come? I mean, that's what malls do. The shops are programs. <laughs> um, and, and I don't think that model works anymore. People now, I mean, you used to have to, I used to go to malls, you know, because I had to buy stuff. And I went for entertainment as a, as, you know, when I was a teenager. But I think now that people shop online and they, people want more than just stores. And so that's why I think cities have to really think creatively about how do you mix the boxes? You know, how do you mix the shopping box with the art box and the theater box and the public space box and the community box and the spiritual box? And so that's where it really takes thinking. And again, that's why I, I know I'm, I feel like I'm not a landscape architect, but Landscape architects also have to deal with that public space. You know, most of the things architects are dealing with is, uh, you know, single use um, private spaces, where landscapes naturally have to deal with these multiple kinds of uses of one kind of space. So I'm fascinated by the city. I also, I mean, two of the things that I think are really interesting here that it seems like some people don't like I love your mud flats. Like if I had more time, that's where I would want to go is go in your mud flats because it's nature. It's like it's nature. Those are natural. You know, I saw the cranes fishing. I mean, I know there's plants in there, and and the other thing that I'm fascinated about here is your tides. You know that you have these huge tide difference because I live in New York and I was thinking about it when I saw your tides. I was thinking. I don't ever notice, it. I've lived in New York 30 years, I've never noticed the tides changing. And the tides are nature. I mean, it's the moon, you know, move, you know we don't, we think of the moon as just up there, the moon's actually making the water move up and down. And so 
I think thinking about the things that are challenges in the city, you know, how do you take advantage of that? I think that's also for your open space. You know, as the city continue, it hasn't finished developing, you're gonna be building open spaces that are bigger than the number of people that you have. And so how do you program that? You have to sort of think about it differently. You might be building, you know, your central park might not really feel fully alive for another 20 years when you have another million people here. So how do you, how do you think, think about that? Um, and again, that's where, to me, it's the collaboration of bringing together the landscape architects, the architects, the designers, the artists, the people that run museums. Museums are having such a hard time because no one wants to just go to museums anymore. And so how do you, they need to come outside. They're desperate to come outside. They want the public. And artists, artists want, if, if an artist gets to be in a museum, you go to the museum, you see 200 works, you might miss that piece, you might not even go with that room. Artists love to be in public space because people actually get to see them. And, and not just the art critics or the galleries, you know, the general public, and it's good for their business because whenever an artwork is on the high line, they sell the work for a lot more. <laughs> Thank you. The person next to me has also a question. Okay. 저 그러면 지금 시간 관계상 예, 질문 충분히 받으신 것 같은데 이것으로 오늘 강연을 어, 정리하도록 하겠습니다. 다시 한번 오늘 좋은 강연과 질의응답 성실히 해주신 우리 로버트 하몬드 어, 씨께 그큰 박수로 네 감사합니다. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And IFEZ and Mrs. Kim, thank you so much for bringing here. I'm, I'm excited to come back. Thank you. 네, 감사합니다.